I want to thank everybody for coming this evening uh, to talk about something that is uh, near and dear to my heart because I live in Hardin County in uh, Southern Illinois where a lot of uh, what we're going to be talking about, uh, a lot of the events uh, took place, uh, folklore or fact, and uh, I had the opportunity to write a book about it. And so uh, we'll just start off by talking about uh, how this book came to be. I had written a book in 2017 for Arcadia Press uh, called Triggs Ozark Tours at the Shawnee National Forest. And it's part of the Images of America series. And it's a, a really a picture book of how the Shawnee National Forest came to be. And uh, the main story is that there was a group of men in the 1930s that uh, formed a committee and started offering special uh, tours through the summertime, uh, a three-day tour every year for about 20 years. But uh, the first uh, a few years of that, those tours were to attract attention to Southern Illinois and get the Shawnee National Forest designated. And uh, so that book was written in 2017. And the, like I said, the main part of that book is a picture book. And then the story is told in the captions on the pictures. Uh, 85, 90% of the pictures are all from the 1930s and 40s in that book. And there's uh, over 200 pictures and scans in that book. So after I writ, uh, had written that book, uh, one of the editors at the History Press, which is also an imprint of Arcadia, uh, contacted me and, and said that uh, they, had, they had been wanting to find someone that could write an updated book of the Outlaws of Cave and Rock. The Outlaws of Cave and Rock is pretty a famous book around here. Uh, probably many of you have seen it or read it yourselves. Uh, it was published in 1924 by Otto Rother. And in that book, a lot of the folklore and the stories that we know today about the river pirates of Cave and Rock and the Outlaws uh, were actually, they actually come from that book and, and some of the research he did uh, back in the 1800s. And so when I was given the opportunity to write this book, I said, yeah, I can do that. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Rothert's book is a pretty thick book and there's a lot of dense information in there. And I wasn't given the opportunity and, and I don't know that I, I'm not thankful for that to write that dense of a book. Uh, there, was a lot, there was a word count that I had to stay under. There was a certain size of the book, uh, a certain number of pictures that they wanted the book. So the history press gave me a lot of parameters that I had to follow. And so what I did in order to, print, to publish this book, I decided I was gonna go back and look at a lot of the sources that Rothert used uh, in the 1920s. Uh, and a lot of those books from the or 1800s are now available online because they've been scanned in, especially by universities. A lot of universities have taken those old books and scanned them in. They're all in the public domain now. And so the good thing about them being uh, scanned in and available online is I was able to search them. So I could search keywords in those books and, and, and go right to the uh, things that I was wanting to look at. And so I did that. I, I, I agreed to write the book and, and that was the way I started my research. I went and started looking at a lot of uh, Rothert sources, but then I also had the opportunity to look at a lot of uh, uh, modern historians have looked at some of these folklore and stories and tried to ferret out the uh, fact from the fiction. And uh, a lot of the, the, the groundwork of this fact versus fiction with the River Pirates has been published in a regional uh, magazine called Springhouse that's published here in Southern Illinois. And I had several uh, issues of those that pertain to these river pirates and these outlaws. And so I did a lot of research in those, in those magazines as well from historians that had already done research on these, uh, on these stories. And uh, I was able to get some factual information from them that I added to the book as well. So the way I structured my book is that I pretty much went in a chronological order with these uh, outlaws. And at the end, and, and, and basically wrote an essay on each of the outlaws. And at the end of each chapter or end of each essay, I had what I called author's notes. And I shared some of the factual information that we know uh, from these historians that have, have actually dug in and, and tried to find out what actually occurred. And which in some cases, you know, it's just impossible to find out because the River Pirate era starts back in the 1700s. So tonight we're going to talk about these group of outlaws and, uh, and what we're talking about are horse thieves, counterfeiters, highwaymen, and river pirates. 
And uh, the river pirates are mo more uh, closely associated with the cave at Cave and Rock. Uh, there was counterfeiters up and down the river during this time. Highwaymen are those robbers that would rob people along those pioneer trails as people were coming into uh, western Kentucky and southern Illinois settling and on their way west. And then, of course, horse thieves is, uh, is obvious what that pertains to. And so uh, the outlaws that we want to talk about tonight, uh, the first outlaws that came to the area were Philip and Peter Alston. They were counterfeiters. Uh, the next is John Duff, uh, better known as Duff the Counterfeiter, and of course he was a counterfeiter. Then uh, Samuel Mason, the River Pirate, and then we have Mickey or Big Harp and Wiley or Little Harp. They were uh, uh, known as the first serial killers in the United States uh, in the late 1700s, and of course they were highwaymen, murdering people along the highways. Then we come to Merrick and Roswell Sturdivant. They were counterfeiters. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Ford's Ferry Gang uh, associated with Crittenden County, uh, Kentucky, and uh, Hardin County, Illinois. And then uh, lastly, we'll talk a little bit about John Crenshaw, who operated the Crenshaw House on Hickory Hill in Galvin County. He was a salt baron, and he's the one associated with what used to be called the Old Slave House in Galvin County. So one of the questions that might come up is, why were these folks associated with Cave and Rock? What was it about Cave and Rock that attracted these people? And uh, you have to remember that uh, we're talking about the late 1700s. And in that uh, period of time, all, everything north of the Ohio River was part of the Northwest Territory. It had been designated uh, the Northwest Territory at the end of the American Revolution. Uh, this territory was claimed by the United States from Britain during the American Revolution by George Rogers Clark. He uh, sailed down the Ohio River and landed at Fort Massac and then began a three-day march overland to Kaskaskia, where the British uh, territorial government uh, was. He claimed Kaskaskia and uh, overtook the fort there and then sent a group of men over to Vincennes, Indiana, where the other, uh, the other troops were at and took over Vincennes. And essentially, when Kaskaskia and Vincennes fell, uh, to the United States or to the colonies during the American Revolution, then all of that territory uh, really transferred over to the colonies. There wasn't much more defense than those, those areas. They tried to, they took Vincennes back and then we had to take it back. So there was some fighting in the area, but for all essential purposes, George Rogers Clark was able to secure that uh, to the future United States. And so in the late 1700s, uh, Kentucky becomes a state and one of the things that I talk about is that as enough people came into Kentucky to where Kentucky had a, an adequate population to become a state, not only are people coming in and settling the area and establishing towns, but they're also bringing law and order with them. And so when you bring law and order into a territory or into, into, into a sparsely populated area like that, uh, people aren't going to tolerate counterfeiters and horse thieves and, and, and the criminal element. And so the criminals that were able to operate in the, in the area when, when it was sparsely populated had to move on to a more sparsely settled territory. And so in the late 1700s, it seems like almost all of the counterfeiters and horse thieves and ne'er-do-wells had all gathered at a place called Red Banks, Kentucky. Uh, Red Banks, Kentucky is now known as Henderson, Kentucky, on the other side of the river from Evansville, Indiana. And that's where most of the ne'er-do-wells were. And so a group of vigilantes that called themselves regulators uh, went into Red Banks to clear out all the outlaws. And when they cleared them out of Red Banks, they floated on down the river to a place called Diamond Island, which is down near the confluence with uh, the Ohio River and the Wabash, uh, down by Mount Vernon, Indiana, uh, Mount Vernon, Indiana. And then they ran them out of uh, Diamond Island. And from there, they went down to Cave and Rock. That's how the river pirates ended up in Cave and Rock and at the cave, using it as a base of operations. Uh, what was happening is they were being driven further and further west as the uh, Kentucky, as the Midwest was becoming more uh, settled. Uh, during the late 1700s, nobody was allowed to settle north of the Ohio River in that Northwest Territory yet. Most of the Northwest Territory uh, was Indian land. It was still uh, owned by the Indians. We hadn't, or Native Americans. We hadn't uh, ceded all that ground to the United States by treaty yet. And also during this time, you see a picture of a flatboat on the river on the slide. 
people that had enough uh, surplus in the goods that they were raising, of course, wanted to sell it at market. Uh, the biggest markets were down in the Gulf. Uh, the, the river was a one-way uh, interstate highway of its day. You didn't go upriver until the days of the, sea, uh, the steamboats. So they would build flat boats, much like the picture you see here. They would put, put produce, they would put a livestock that they wanted to sell on the rivers, uh, the Kentucky, the Cumberland, the Ohio, the Wabash, all led uh, to the Mississippi and then down the Mississippi to Natchez or uh, eventually New Orleans was uh, opened as a port for them. So people that were settling in this area and wanting to uh, sell their surplus would load it on flat boats, such as the one you see there, and float it down the river. Well, as they were floating down the river, they were very susceptible to outlaws because there was just a few men operating those boats. And uh, if you had very many outlaws, you could take over a boat fairly, fairly easily. So that's why how they ended up in Cabin Rock and, and why the criminal element was so easily established here. You had relatively uh, unprotected boats going down the river and you had a sparse population so that you could operate here without, uh, the outlaws could operate here without getting in too much trouble. Uh, counterfeiting all, along the Ohio River was not uh, like a stamped counterfeit coin like we see uh, the United States making today. Uh, back in the day, they would make these molds like you see here, and you can see the notch in the top of the mold. And what they would do is they would melt down lead and pour into these molds and make their coinage uh, in molds uh, with molten lead, and then they would just cover them, uh, that lead, and make counterfeit coinage that way. The first outlaws that came to the area I mentioned before was Philip and Peter Alston. Uh, Philip Alston, it's a father and son. Uh, Philip was the father, Peter was the son. And Philip Alston came up from Natchez and uh, he was doing counterfeiting down in Natchez and uh, the Spain, he got in trouble with the Spaniards down there and they ran him out. Alston ended up in Red Banks. Uh, from Red Banks, he left the Red Banks areas uh, probably before the vigilantes came in and cleaned Red Banks out. But he's the first counterfeiter that we really associate with the cave at Cave and Rock. Uh, Peter, his son, came along uh, somewhere in the same time period. And Peter is also later associated with the Samuel Mason game. So Philip Alston is doing counterfeit coinage at the cave in Cave and Rock. And then Duff the counterfeiter is the next one that comes along. Duff lived in what is now Caseyville, Kentucky, which is across the river from uh, Battery Rock, Illinois. Uh, he had a cabin there. And, and the legends say, the folklore is that Philip Alston taught Duff, John Duff, how to do counterfeit coinage uh, before Alston left. Alston ended up going back to Natchez when he left the area. And so Duff the counterfeiter is the next counterfeiter or next outlaw associated with the cave. And again, this is in the late 1700s that we're talking about. And so Duff started his counterfeiting operation and, and, and folklore says that he found a lead deposit on the Saline River. And Saline River is kind of on the line between Hardin and Gallatin County, Illinois. And the Saline River deposit of lead is where he mined uh, his lead to get the lead for his counterfeit coinage. And so he's, and of course, uh, we know him today as Duff the Counterfeiter. So, so he was pretty much known for his counterfeiting. Uh, the story goes that he lost his life when there was enough people upset over the counterfeit coinage going out that Fort Massac, uh, Zebulon Pike uh, Sr. that was at uh, Fort Massac as the commander, sent uh, some men up to capture him and he ended up dying in a scuffle up at uh, his house at Caseyville. There's actually three legends about how he died, but uh, uh, the main one uh, is that he died uh, there at his uh, home at Caseyville, Kentucky, what is now Caseyville, Kentucky. So we have the Alstons as the first outlaws. The next outlaw is Duff the Counterfeiter. And then after Duff the Counterfeiter, we come to Samuel Mason. Uh, Samuel Mason is actually the only river pirate or outlaw that folklore says that was at the cave that we actually have proof that he was at the cave. And uh, again, he's got his start at Red Banks, uh, Kentucky, up at Henderson, Kentucky today, made his way to Diamond Island and then made his way to the cave. And when you think about river pirates, uh, like you've seen on movies, on TV, uh, the, the bottom left picture is from Davy Crockett and the River Pirates. That was one of the first productions that was filmed in Cave and Rock, and it was actually filmed on the Ohio River at Cave and Rock 
And there are scenes uh, taken from outside the cave that made it in that movie. Walt Disney came in the 1950s and did their filming here for the River Davy Crockett and the River Pirates. And it was first on TV on the Wonderful World of Disney. And then they took a couple of those episodes together and made a movie. And uh, the other movie that was filmed here, is so, you know, talking about river pirates and, and thievery at the cave is a movie that was filmed in the 60s called How the West Was Won. And it was also filmed in Hardin County along the Ohio River, uh, but they didn't actually film at the cave. They made a mock-up of the cave upriver and used it for whatever reason. I really don't know why they didn't film at the cave in that movie. But the, the Walt Disney film was done in the 50s. How the West Was Won was done in the 60s. And both of those movies do a pretty good job of showing what river piracy was like. The river pirates used the cave as the base of their outlawing and uh, preying on boats. And uh, on the left-hand side of this uh, slide, you see a big rock bluff. That is actually Tower Rock. That's a Shawnee National Forest uh, recreational area in Hardin County. And it's supposed to be the highest point on the Ohio River. It's between Cave and Rock, Illinois and Elizabethtown, Illinois. And uh, from up on that high point, and you can see the, the overlook in the picture below it, uh, from that overlook, you could see way up the river and you could see boats coming down the river. And so when you saw something coming down the river that you wanted to uh, try to prey on and try to uh, uh, steal from, you had plenty of opportunities to see them uh, far off that you could go down below and get your ambush set up. Uh, one of the way the river pirates would operate, sometimes they would be in the cave and they would yell at boats coming by that they could come into the cave and cool off, that they had drinks inside. Uh, they might have had uh, ladies inside. Uh, in Davy Crockett and the River Pirates, they even have men inside the cave disguising their voice and hollering out to the boats going by. Uh, Mike Fink and Davy Crockett's boats as they go by, they yell. They yell out, uh, pretending to be women, trying to attract those men off the boats to come into the cave. And of course, if they could get in anybody to land uh, their boat, then uh, the river pirates would rush out and take over their boat. Uh, something else that happened in, in the movie that, that is also part of the folklore is that they would dress themselves up as Native Americans and use canoes and go out and try to attack the boats. And then people coming down the river would think it wasn't actually uh, uh, settlers or, or outlaws doing it, but it was the Native Americans attacking them. And so they wouldn't be looking for Europeans in the area or, in, or United States uh, citizens in the area. They'd be looking for Native Americans. So they would get on the bluffs and do it. Another thing, that, another tactic that the river pirates used was to place somebody on the islands in the river right across from Tower Rock and just down from the cave at Caven Rock is an island called Hurricane Island. It's spelled hurricane, but locally it's known as Hurricane Island. And oftentimes they would put one of their pi river pirates on the beach of that island. And as boats come by, they would wave them down and they would pretend to be marooned there. And because their boat had sunk and they were trapped on that island and they were seeking the goodwill of the people going by in the flatboats, and ask them to come and give them a ride because they were marooned on the island. And of course, again, when the boat would land to pick them up, all their Confederates would be in the uh, trees and come out and rush the boat and take it over. So that's just some of the tactics that they used to uh, attract boats and uh, overpower the boats. And Samuel Mason, like we said, is the next river pirate of prominence. And he's the only river pirate that we know is, that was truly associated with the cave at Cave and Rock. And he had a gang there. Uh, the regulators that I mentioned before eventually ran Samuel Mason's gang out of uh, the cave at, at Cave and Rock, and they went on down to New Madrid and eventually uh, down into the Natchez area, and Samuel Mason lost his life down there when they put a bounty on his head, and some of his own gang members uh, cut off his head and turned it in for the bounty. And when they turned his head in for the bounty, uh, the people that, that accepted it, the uh, law enforcement recognized the two people turning it in as outlaws themselves. Uh, the legend is that one of the outlaws that turned in Samuel Mason's head was Peter Alston, the son of Philip Alston. And uh, the other one was uh, Little Harp or Wiley Harp. Uh, that's the legend, that's the folklore, but there's really no proof that it was those two. When they did a, a, a trial, and there's still the trial transcripts available today of that trial that happened when, when they were arrested, uh, they did not use those names. They used uh, other names. And so they were either aliases that they were under, or uh, it wasn't 
little harp and it wasn't Peter Alston, but it was the actual men listed in the transcripts. And this is just folklore. One of the stories associated with the cave in Cave de Rock is that there was a man by the name of James Wilson that ran it as a liquor vault and house of entertainment. He had a sign out in front of the cave that, that had this on it, Wilson's Liquor Vault and House of Entertainment. And uh, as boats came down the river, he would his sign would be out front as a billboard attracting people to stop and come in. For years, we've thought that, or it's been said that James Wilson was just an alias for Samuel Mason. And uh, that, that that was just an alias he was using. There's another river pirate associated down river near the uh, cache where the cache empties into the Ohio River uh, named Colonel Plug. And Colonel Plug is supposedly one of the uh, aliases of Samuel Mason as well. But this man here, uh, James Wilson, if you uh, see the log cabin on the left-hand side of the screen, this, is, so, this was at one time, and I guess it still is, the oldest structure in Hardin County, Illinois. It was on a bluff outside of Elizabethtown. And if you look at a squatters map of uh, squatters that were in Illinois or the Illinois Territory before Illinois became a state, there is a James Wilson listed as squatting there on the side of this cabin. And so if James Wilson was an alias for Samuel Mason, he also built a cabin and was a known squatter in Illinois down at Elizabethtown. This cabin was uh, just east of the Rose Hotel in Elizabethtown, if you're familiar with that. Uh, just upriver from the river restaurant that floats on the river in Elizabethtown, if you might have ate there. This cabin sat on a bluff overlooking the river. Again, a bluff that you could see uh, several miles upriver uh, and see if anybody was coming down the river. And uh, this cabin now has been reconstructed, and, and you can see that it's been rebuilt. And it now sits at the Pioneer Village in uh, the Saline Creek Pioneer Village in Harrisburg, Illinois, the historical society there has a little uh, walking museum of old structures that they have collected and restored on that site. And it, at, at that site in, in Harrisburg, Illinois, there's a sign in front of this cabin that says the mystery cabin of Hardin County. And it tells a little bit of story that this was, according to folklore, this was a river, river pirates ca uh, cabin. So it's been saved and it's now sitting in Harrisburg. Uh, but at one time, it was the oldest structure in Hardin County. And it could be associated with Samuel Mason. It could be associated with James Wilson if he was a real person. And, uh, and it ties this cabin with the sign that was, that was at the uh, cave at Cave and Rock. So what really brought uh, outlaw and thievery into Illinois? As the Northwest Territory began to be settled, uh, they started breaking off states out of the Northwest Territory. The first state that was broken off was Ohio in 1803. And then when Ohio became a state, then the rest of the territory became the Indiana Territory. And uh, it was the Indiana Territory until uh, Indiana became a state. And then once Indiana became a state, then it was split into the Illinois Territory. And uh, you can see the Michigan Territory was split off in 1805. And so in uh, 1803, two important uh, things happened. The man on the left-hand uh, side of your screen is William Henry Harrison, and he was the territorial governor of the Indiana Territory. And part of what he did is started making treaties with the Native Americans, ceding their land to the United States. And in 1803, he uh, signed a treaty with the Kaskaskia Indians that op opened up all of Southern Illinois for settlement. Also, what happened in 1803 was the Louisiana Purchase. And then when, when the Louisiana Purchase happened, that opened up all of the Mississippi River and New Orleans for the settlers in the Midwest. Uh, the Midwest, uh, at, at different times between the Spanish, the French, and, and Britain, uh, sometimes all these states were friendly with one another. Uh, these countries were friendly with one another. Sometimes they weren't friendly with one another. And so if, if you happen to be going down the river and, and we're not uh, friendly with the French at the time or, or if the British weren't friendly with the French back before the revolution, you might find yourselves being uh, uh, taken by the, this country and all of your goods confiscated. And so all your hard work getting it down to market would be for naught. And of course, New Orleans was the big market, so everybody wouldn't be able to use New Orleans. 
and it was under Spanish rule for quite a while. Of course, it was under French rule for quite a while. But then when the Louisiana Purchase happened, then all of that territory came into the United States. And so in 1803, the two big events that happened was Louisiana Purchase opening up all of the Mississippi River for travel and for commerce, including New Orleans, and Illinois was now available for settlement. So settlers started pouring into this area. And uh, in 1803, we are past the period of Samuel Mason, we're past the period of the Austins, we're past the period of Duff the Counterfeiter. All of these men had actually uh, uh, left the area or had passed away by this time. And uh, the Hart brothers, who I, I kind of skipped over a while ago, the Hart brothers are both uh, out of the area and, and Big Hart was even dead at this time. I should have mentioned when we were talking about the cave at Cave and Rock uh, that uh, the, there's two stories associated with the Harps. Uh, the Harps, as I mentioned a while ago, are the first serial killers in the United States. They did most of what they did, uh, their highway work, uh, killing people in Kentucky and Tennessee. And uh, they were captured in, and they were in jail in Russellville, Kentucky, along with their women. They, they, the two brothers had three wives and uh, they had children and they were captured and put in prison in Russellville. And the uh, Hart brothers were able to escape before they came to trial. They would have undoubtedly been killed if they had uh, gone to trial. But they escaped before they came to trial, and uh, that led, and they left their women behind. And after the Harps escaped from jail, the women were acquitted by the town because they they knew it was the Harp brothers that were really doing uh, most of the murdering and, and and outlaw work. And plus, these women had had children, uh, so they didn't want to hold them in jail. They didn't want to, uh, of course, take their lives. So the townspeople in Russellville, you know, gave them some supplies and sent them on their way after they were, after they were let go. And the folklore says that the Harps had prearranged to go to the cave at Cave and Rock and told the women that once they were released to make their way to the cave and that's where they would rendezvous. And so the Hart brothers came to the cave at Cave and Rock and joined Samuel Mason's gang at this time. So this would be the late 1790s. Uh, 1790s, from around 1797 to 1799. And so the Harps were there, part of the Samuel Mason gang, and the women were let go, so they made their way to the Green River, and then they floated up the Green River to the Ohio River, and then down the Ohio River till they made it to the cave at Cave and Rock, and they joined up with their husbands. And the two stories uh, with the Harps at Cave and Rock, uh, one story involves a boat that, that landed just upriver from the cave, and there was a couple on board and they were uh, the, the captain of the boat wanted to repair the boat. So the couple went up on top of the bluff and was having a picnic lunch while they were waiting for the boat to be repaired. And the harps came upon them and the harps tried to kill them, but they were able to jump over the bluff and, and uh, survived. And uh, when they jumped over the bluff and survived, they made their way back to the boat, warned the captain, and they all got back on the boat and went down before uh, the Hart brothers were able to, to uh, murder them or to capture them. And of course, they didn't stop at the cave either. Uh, the other story associated with the Hart brothers is that the gang had just uh, captured a boat and they were all celebrating with a big bonfire in front of the uh, cave on the riverside. And uh, when all the pirates were uh, celebrating at the cave around that campfire, the harps took the captain of the boat up to the bluff on top of the cave and stripped him down and tied him to the back of a horse, covered the horse's eyes so the horse couldn't see, and they caused that horse to gallop over the top of the bluff. And of course, the man and the horse fell to their death right there in front of the mouth of the cave where all of the pirates were celebrating. And the folklore says that when the river pirates saw how nasty and gruesome the Hart brothers were, they decided that they were just too much for them and they sent the Hart brothers on their way. So the Harps and, and their ladies left the cave, the cave and rock, made their way to Tennessee and the next known murder that they committed was in Tennessee. So that's the folklore. Uh, we really have uh, doubts that the Hart brothers actually ever came to Illinois. When they escaped jail in Russellville, Kentucky, the next known place that they had a murder is in Tennessee. So it's highly doubtful that they would have left Russellville, Kentucky, came all the way up to Illinois, did their uh, outlaw acts at the cave, and then made their way back to Tennessee. So probably when they left Russellville, they, they plunged down into Tennessee and, the, and their ladies met them down there. But that's the, so, that, that's the stories of the Hart brothers that are associated with the cave at Cave and Rock.
The next river pirates that we have or, or counterfeiters are the Sturdivant brothers, Merrick and Roswell Sturdivant. Uh, they had a fort called Sturdivant's Fort, and it was a uh, one or two block houses surrounded by a palisade or a fence, fenced in area uh, where they produced counterfeit coinage and, and, and bills as well. Uh, on the right hand side of your picture is a picture of a blockhouse, what it looked like. This is actually one of the blockhouses at Fort Massac. And if you look at the picture on the left, this is the view of Rose Claire, Illinois from Elizabethtown, Illinois, uh, in front of the Rose Hotel. And if you look at the picture, you'll see a water tower off on top of the bluff. That's the Rose Claire water tower. And of course, Rose Claire wouldn't have been uh, settled at this time. But if you look at the big green area that's devoid of trees to the right of the river to the, of the water tower, that area is where Sturdivant's Fort uh, sat. And you can tell by the high bluff and, and the view, again, from Sturdivant's Fort, you were able to look up river and see if anything was coming. The story about the Sturdivants are that they did not operate in the, in the cave, but they used the cave at Cave and Rock as kind of a banking center where they would exchange their counterfeit coins and counterfeit currency for legitimate currency. And the exchange rate was if you brought $16 of legitimate currency to them, they would give you $100 of their counterfeit money in exchange for the 16. So that's how they just, they use the cave at Cave and Rock to distribute their counterfeit uh, currency. The people in Shawneetown, Shawneetown was established at this time, and we're talking in the 1820s now. And in the mid 1820s, they, they had traced all the counterfeit uh, money that was being circulated in Southern Illinois back to the Sturdivans. And so there was a posse that got together in Shawneetown and went down and raided Sturdivans Fort uh, to capture the Sturdivans and, and bring them back for trial, which they did. They, they went down, they surprised them, they were able to capture the Sturdivans, and uh, they left the, the fort and, and started taking them back to Shawneetown. Well, one of the things that uh, the Sturdivans had was a, a trumpet or a bugle that they would sound anytime they were in trouble. And when the posse attacked them and, and started bringing them back to uh, Shawneetown, they were able, the Sturdivans were able to sound that bugle, and that was a signal to all their compatriots that lived around them to come and help them. And so the posse knew that they didn't have much time, and so they hurriedly grabbed the Sturdivans, got on horseback, and started on their way back to Shawneetown with them. They traveled all that day, and that night they stayed in Potts Inn, which we're going to talk about here shortly. And they spent the night in Potts Inn with the Sturdivan gang hot on their tail. And uh, the next day, they, though, they were able to leave Potts Inn, make it to Shawneetown. And when uh, they brought them uh, uh, to trial before the judge in Shawneetown, in their haste to get away from Sturdivant's Fort, they hadn't brought any of the evidence with them. And there was plenty of evidence there. There was, there was ink, there was paper, there was coinage, there was the, uh, the stamps for the coinage. They hadn't grabbed any of the evidence, and so the Sturdivants were let go for lack of evidence. It was just their word against the posse's word. And so they were let go, and uh, the counterfeiting continued to go on, so uh, Shawneetown got another posse together to go down and raid the fort again, and this time they were going to get the evidence. So they made it to the fort. Well, between the first raid and the second raid, the Sturdivans had added a cannon to their uh, defense. And when the posse raided the fort, they, they fired back with this cannon. And so the posse realized that they didn't have enough firepower and men to overtake the fort. So they floated and they arrived by riverboat. They'd used the steamboat to get there. So they went on down to Golconda and drafted some more men to come and help them. They went back up to the fort, and then with the third raid, they were able to take over the fort. A few people passed, uh, passed uh, died in the, in the raid, but they were able to raid the fort, and they were uh, able to capture the Sturdivans and take them back to Shawneetown. So once they, and, and they took the evidence with them. So once they got back to Shawneetown, uh, they came up for trial, and the Sturdivans hired a attorney in Shawneetown named John McLean. John McLean was actually the first U.S. representative from Illinois in uh, the U.S. Congress when Illinois became a state in 1818. And so they had, uh, they had hired him. He had also been a state rep, and he had been the Speaker of the Illinois House. And so he had quite a, a, a resume that they hired. And so what John McLean did to help get him off trial was he kept uh, 
uh, filing uh, continuances. And he fired, uh, filed continuance after continuance after continuance till somewhere along the line, they decided to just drop the case, which is odd. But uh, so uh, McLean was able to get him off. And uh, when they came time for to settle up, they stiffed him on the bill and didn't pay uh, their attorney fees to him. And so he started trying to collect money from the Sturdivans. And John McLean died before he was ever able to collect the funds for, for getting the Sturdivans off, uh, off their counterfeit charges. Uh, he's buried in Westwood Cemetery just outside of Shawneetown. The Sturdivans left the area and uh, one more story associated with the Sturdivans is that uh, one of them ended up owning a tavern down in Natchez, and there's a story associated with him and uh, Jim Bowie down there uh, before Jim Bowie went to the Alamo. But again, that's a legend and a, and a folklore. So the Sturdivans operated in the area in the 1820s. Uh, the next is the Ford's Ferry Gang. Uh, James Ford was a, a justice of the peace and quite an influential uh, businessman in Crittenden County at the turn of the century. He started in the early 1800s. And uh, he, his claim to fame is that he uh, owned a ferry on the Ohio River and he maintained a high uh, water road and his was a high water ferry, meaning that even when the spring floods come and the river was up, his road was passable and his ferry was still in operation. He used what was called a horse-drawn ferry, and you can see a depiction, a drawing of it on the lower right-hand side, where the horses would go around in a circle on a capstan, and that would had a differential gear that would drive a paddle wheel behind it, and that's how they drove people across the river uh, with that, that horse-drawn ferry. And so his uh, place was called Ferry, Ohio, and uh, he maintained a road uh, miles into Kentucky and miles into Illinois leading to and from his ferry, and he went and had men go down the, the roads leading to, to uh, Illinois. And everywhere there was a crossroads, they put up signage that said, this is the best ferry, this is the best route to Illinois. And so he attracted a lot of settlers coming into the Illinois doing that. He also put flyers and stuff in uh, roadside taverns to attract people. So he did a lot of advertising to get the people to come to him and use his ferry. The story associated with him though, that he had a gang that they would rob anybody that looked like they were uh, had any in, uh, goods or uh, any wealth at all, they would rob them. And the story goes that they would first meet up with any settlers headed to Illinois in a place called Pickering Hill. Now the picture on the left is from the top of Pickering Hill looking uh, northeast towards Illinois and, and in Kentucky. And so that's where the gang would first meet them. This was just a few miles away from the Ohio River. And so the gang members would be there posing as settlers themselves, and they would say, we're going to the ferry. Are you going to the ferry? Well, let's just go to the ferry together. And so on the road to the ferry, they would end up finding out whether the people uh, had anything worth stealing or not. And if they did, oftentimes they would kill them there in Kentucky and dispose of the bodies in a place called Murder's Cave or Murder's Hole, uh, which was a, a shelter bluff that, that was had a chimney open up to the top of the bluff. And this chimney, uh, at the top of the bluff was near uh, Ford's Ferry Road. And so uh, according to legend, they would just dump the bodies in that, in that cave and dispose of them that way. The picture that you see in the middle is actually Ford's Ferry Road. And this is where the road is just about a mile away from the ferry landing. And, and many parts of this road are still visible today going through the trees. And, and, many, and many parts of this road are still in use today and as you can see here, this is a <clears throat> graveled and oil and chipped road leading down to the riverfront and leading to uh, Ford's Ferry, Ohio. The other end of, of James Ford's road in Illinois is a place called Potts Inn. And this is a picture of Potts Inn from the 1920s. Uh, but we're talking about thing, events that happened in the 1920s, 1930s. As a matter of fact, Sturdivant's Fort that I mentioned before was on property that at one time was owned by James Ford. And the picture on the left here, I don't know if you can make it out very well or not, but this is a remnant of Ford's Ferry Road in Illinois. And even though it hasn't been in use in well over 100 years, you can see that the road is so hard packed and, and, and it's been traversed so much that even though this road isn't being maintained, it's so hard packed that still no shrubs or trees really grow in the middle of the road. It's just a little bit of grasses that grow in the middle of the road even today. 
So uh, where you see that road on the left-hand side, this is at Potts Inn. And on the right-hand side is, is the inn. And on the left-hand side is a spring. And this is the spring that flows there on the left. And uh, there is a legend of, uh, of Billy Potts associated with it. Uh, Potts Inn was owned by Isaiah and Polly uh, Potts. Polly was a blue from Kentucky and uh, uh, Isaiah Potts had come from Kentucky as well. And the legend goes that if, if people traveling across on a Ford's Ferry Road made it past Pickering Hill, they made it past the Murder's Cave, they had made it past the Ferry, Ohio, and crossed uh, into Illinois, Potts Inn was the last place that the Ford's Ferry Gang tried to rob people and kill them before they made it on past uh, the area that James Ford's gang operated. And so if they made it to Potts Inn, the story goes that Isaiah would invite anybody that had been on the trail to come and get a good cool drink from the spring that flowed uh, on the other side of the Ford's Ferry Road, the, the very spring that you see right here. And uh, the story goes that when they bent over to get a drink there, he would hit them over the back of the head and that this spring just ran red from all the blood of the victims of uh, Isaiah Potts. Now where Billy Potts comes into play is Isaiah and Polly had a son named Billy, and he was part of the murdering gang, and he got so adept at it that he wasn't paying attention, and, and he murdered somebody in front of some, some locals, and when they saw what he had done, uh, Isaiah and Polly knew that he was going to be brought to trial, so they sent Billy off to uh, live somewhere else so that he wouldn't get caught and arrested and, 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 and put to death. So Billy lived away from the area for many, many years. And uh, after he'd grown up, he, he moved back or he came back to visit his parents and he had changed a lot over the years. He grew a beard and maybe gained weight and gotten older. And when he arrived, he was going to surprise his mom and dad. And when he got to uh, Potts Inn, he went and got a drink like most everybody did. And when he went and got a drink, his dad uh, hit him over the head and killed him like he's done so many other uh, settlers that were coming through and they buried him. Well, later that day, uh, some of the the ferry gang that had been on the ferry when Billy crossed the river knew Billy was in town and they went up to see uh, Billy and to have a, a reunion with him and his parents. And when they got there, they asked about Billy and, and Isaiah and Polly didn't know what they were talking about. They said, Billy's been gone for years. And uh, as it turns out, uh, they said, no, Billy came to visit you today. And, and Isaiah and Polly realized that they had killed their son and, and Polly remembered he had a birthmark on the back of his uh, shoulder. And so they went and, and unearthed his grave and turned him over and looked and, and lo and behold, the birthmark that she remembered was there. And so the legend or the story goes that after they killed their son, Billy, that they closed up the inn and they never murdered anybody again. And it was pretty much the end of the uh, Ford's Ferry gang up in that area. James Ford died in the mid 30s, a, a group of vigilantes, not 1830s, a group of vigilantes uh, killed him because he had killed his ferry operator, Vincent Simpson. They got into a, a disagreement over one of the enslaved people that they had traded uh, each other. And uh, they said Vincent knew too much about James Ford and James Ford knew too much about Vincent Simpson. So they couldn't turn each other in. And, uh, and James Ford had Vincent killed, and, and then the people that respected Vincent and, and were friends of him then killed James Ford in retaliation. One of the stories even goes that uh, uh, Vincent's own son was the one that pulled the trigger that killed James Ford. And one of the stories associated with Ford's burial, when they were burying him, uh, they, were, they were using his own enslaved people uh, for the burial, and a thunderstorm came up, and they dug the grave, and they were trying to get him buried and a thunderclap uh, uh, startled the, the enslaved people as they were lowering them into the grave and the casket uh, became a lodged head first into the grave and, and they were told to go in there and, and, and ride it and not uh, believe him like that. Well, it started raining real heavily and so everybody was getting back under cover and so the slave or the enslaved people uh, just covered him up like he was. And, uh, and one of the slaves always said that uh, they sent uh, James Ford head first into hell uh, because of the way that he was buried. So that's the folklore around uh, James Ford and the Ford's Ferry game. So briefly, we'll talk about Crenshaw and the Salt Baron of Gallatin County. One of the things that's unique about Illinois is that Illinois was came into the United States as a free state, but 
because of the salt wells in, in Illinois, uh, we're, we're going to require so much manual labor to operate. The first Illinois constitution allowed slavery to be in Illinois at the salt wells in Galveston County. And that's what's depicted in the middle picture here in a, a mural that's painted in Galveston County. You see enslaved people operating those salt wells by taking the water out of the salt wells and boiling that, that water down, that brine down to the salt. Uh, on the left-hand side is a picture of John Hart Crenshaw and uh, his wife in later years. And on the right-hand side is the house that they built. On, he called it Hickory Hill. We call it the Crenshaw House today. But from the 1930s to the 1990s, it was a roadside attraction called the Old Slave House. And that third story window that you see in the attic, uh, the story goes that he had cells up there where he would keep the slaves overnight. And, and he also had a breeding program going up there. And if any of the slaves uh, had been uh, ornery or, or uh, needed punished, he would take them up there to punish them. Now, archeologists have done studies of this house when it was bought by the state of Illinois. And they've looked at that and, and, and looked at the house and the structure. And they really don't think that those rooms up there were ever used as cages. They think that that uh, all that was put in place to sell tickets for a roadside attraction. If anything that was going on up there, it was places where people that were coming to do business with uh, Crenshaw, he had places up there where he could put them up overnight, uh, you know, business people that came to do business, they could stay there overnight and then they could head out at the next day to go back to wherever they came from. So essentially, uh, Crenshaw was running maybe like a bed and breakfast is what we'd call it today. Because that middle floor that you see with that upper story porch, that's where uh, Crenshaw and his family slept. And so it's highly doubtful with all the land that he owned around there and the he had quarters for all of his enslaved people. Why would he have all that going on in the attic above his family's head when he's had, when he had plenty of uh, places on the plantation that he could be doing these things. So Crenshaw operated the salt well using enslaved people, but he couldn't buy slaves or like, uh, you know, from slave traders at the time. But uh, the Constitution didn't allow that, but it did allow them to lease slaves from slave states. And so Missouri and Kentucky were both slave states. And so Crenshaw was able to get his workforce by going to the slave states and leasing slaves. The Illinois Constitution, though, had a caveat in it that after they had worked for a year, you had to give them their freedom. And so Crenshaw, to get around that, would, would lease these slaves from, let's say, Kentucky. And he would work them for 362, 363 days. And then right before the year was up, he would take them back to whoever he leased them from, turn them back over to him and release them again and take them back to the salt works. So even though Illinois was uh, giving an opportunity for enslaved people to get their freedom, they're, they're, they never could get their freedom because they had, had a workaround around it. Uh, there's more stories about Crenshaw and the slave house but I see that I've already gone over the time that I was going to try to talk today, and I did want to leave some opportunity for questions. So we'll stop there and with the uh, presentation, and if anybody has any questions they'd uh, like to ask, I'm ready for questions. I guess I could say, you know, I'm, I'm, the intention here was to do the presentation and let you all know about the River Pirates, but the book that I showed at the beginning, uh, Cave and Rock Pirates and Outlaws, is available on Amazon, you know, if you want, if you're interested in the book and the essays in it, there's also an essay on a Civil War era outlaw named Logan Belt. I did, I knew I wasn't going to have time to get to him, so I didn't, I didn't even put it on the presentation tonight. So there is one that I didn't even mention tonight, and of course, there's a whole lot more in the book than I was able to share tonight. So it's available on Amazon, and uh, a few other uh, stores around the area have it as well. Like Walgreens, for some reason, has it, and uh, Barnes and Noble and Carbondale, I know, has it and in Evansville. And uh, the uh, Books a Million, though, in Paducah has never carried it. I see your question. It says, did the story of the bodies being thrown into the hole prove true? I don't know of anybody that can say that it's 100% true. Uh, the folklore is that, that the, the bodies that were thrown in the top of the bluff in that chimney or the top of that murder hole, uh, of course, would make their way down into the bottom of that uh, shelter bluff below and and the folklore is that several people have gone in over the years and found bones and stuff in that but i don't know of anyone that that can claim that it was 100 percent true but 
that is the story and the folklore associated with that. And Ford's Ferry Road does go uh, not too many feet off of Murder's Cave. It goes right beside it. A lot of these, a lot of this folklore is very difficult to uh, prove happened because a lot of the people we're talking about, uh, nothing was ever written. Everything that was written about them was written many decades later. Uh, the Sturdivans did indeed have the fort at Rosaclair. That is a fact, and they were indeed counterfeiters. So that's fact. Uh, Duff the counterfeiter is actually also associated with uh, George Rogers Clark. Uh, in Clark's uh, writings, he says that when he was at Fort Massac and getting ready to go across country to Kaskaskia, he met John Duff there. And uh, we're assuming that the John Duff that he met at Fort Massac was the John Duff that also became Duff the counterfeiter. But uh, that's just an assumption. So a lot of this folklore can't be uh, proven 100%. But I like to say, let's not let the truth get in the way of a good story. All right. We had somebody want to know if you could touch briefly on the excavation of the Crenshaw House. Sure. When the Crenshaw House was bought by the state of Illinois, uh, by the Illinois Historic Preservation, uh, they contracted with SIU, uh, School of Archaeology, to come in and do some uh, historical perspectives on the house. One of the stories associated with the house is there's a, a, there's a big area on the back side of the house where it looks like uh, two big double doors like barn doors could have been at one time. And, and the legend says that because uh, Crenshaw, uh, well, Crenshaw is known to have run a reverse underground railroad. He was capturing free blacks in Illinois and trying to sell them back into slavery in the South. And he was actually indicted four different times or associated in four different uh, cases of free blacks being sold back into slavery. He was never convicted on this, but there are four cases where he was indicted. He was a very powerful man because the, the salt well leases and the taxes, taxes uh, that came in off the salt production uh, came up with either a quarter or a third of the revenue of the new state of Illinois. And so anyone that was doing that much commerce and economic activity, you know, had a lot of influence in the community. And so uh, apparently he was operating a reverse underground railroad. Uh, buying or stealing free blacks and selling them back into slavery. So the story goes that the, that big door on the back side of the house is where they would open it up and they would have uh, in free blacks that they had captured in the back of a wagon and they were able to drive right into the back of the uh, cave or back of the uh, house and close the doors and whisk them up to that third story where they had their cells up there and keep them overnight till a slave trader could come and, and purchase them and, and take them back to Kentucky, Missouri, wherever they happen to be going with the, with the enslaved people. And so by bringing their wagon right into the house and closing the door, no, no prying eyes could see what was going on there. That's the folklore. Now, when SIU went in, they were able to go underneath the house. The house was built in the 1830s. And when they went under the house, the original foundation is there. And looking at that original foundation underneath the house, they could see that it was never made such that wagons could be driven in and out of that house, you know, in, in order not to be seen. And so uh, they did, they also did mapping, uh, radar mapping of the backyard and they saw the remains of a circle drive. because So the main drive to the house used to come in from the north, whereas today it comes in from the south and comes up to a parking lot in front of the house. Back in the day, you would have approached the house from the, from, uh, the back side, from the north side, and they could see the remains of the old driveway and a circle drive in front of the house. And so what they're speculating is probably at one time there was a receiving porch on the back side of that house and those big doors was probably where a set of French doors were. And that's where they would greet people that were coming to the house and that wasn't ever used as a, wag a place for wagons to come in. So that's one thing of the archeology. span They were able to find the original uh, outhouse and one of the things they always do use uh, when they go back and look at old buildings like that is try to find the outhouse because uh, the outhouse was also where you threw all your scraps and anything that uh, like busted china, broken china, or anything in the house that you wanted to throw away oftentimes ended up in the outhouse and, and uh, along with the other waste that goes in there. 
And so they were able to do some digs in the old outhouse and they found some china and or broken china and different artifacts from the house. And they never, I don't think were ever able to determine where the kitchen was because the kitchen at that time would have been separate from the house. But then they, on the third story where the cells are, quote unquote cells, uh, they looked and examined the door jams and they examined, uh, there's little windows in it. And today there's bars on it, there's chicken wire on it. Uh, where it was set up for that uh, roadside attraction. But when you look, really look at it and look at the way it was constructed, the walls are really thin. They're like single uh, ply walls. And uh, of course the doors would have been a single ply door, real thin door as well. And so they really don't think that those uh, quote unquote cells would have ever kept anybody in there that, that really didn't want to stay in there. And so they just find a hard time believing that the third story was indeed ever used to uh, lock enslaved people up and keep them from uh, being able to go anywhere. Now, does that absolve Crenshaw from any uh, wrongdoing? No, he was not a nice man. He did a lot of things that, that he was never uh, uh, convicted of, that he was indicted of. Uh, so, he, so he probably wasn't a nice man, but uh, did he actually keep uh, uh, enslaved people in the third story? Probably not. Did he, uh, did he actually bring enslaved people in that back door, barn door and wagons so that they couldn't be seen? Probably not. The, the question is, was there evidence uh, found to support reverse trade, slave trade on the property? Uh, there, there are some stories that have some uh, a fact to them that they were able to track down I don't really have time to talk to them today. Uh, today. There's some, I mentioned uh, some of them in my book, and then there's others that have also written about them, like John Musgrave. If you do a, a, a Google of John Musgrave, he's written a book, and he was one of the principal historians that did uh, research on the goings on at the slave house or the Crenshaw house back in the day. So, so yes, there are, there are some more uh, details to the stories, but I really don't have time to tell them tonight.